We're in a section in Matthew's gospel where Jesus is giving a lot of what we're calling these harsh truths, these things that are, that are challenging, that are, that are maybe sometimes even offensive. Uh, they're hard to understand some, some are hard to apply. And one of the ones that we're gonna be looking at this morning is a harsh truth dealing with a very difficult issue, that of forgiveness, that many of us struggle with, you know, that we're angry and, and the idea that we just need to forgive and, and that's hard to do. And yet it's a vital issue, it's incredibly important. And uh, so what we're gonna do this morning is we're looking primarily at the end of Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. If you have a Bible, I'd invite you to turn there with me and, uh, and I'd encourage you to keep your Bible open throughout our time this morning so you could follow along in the passage as you, know, you see the points come from, from God's word. Uh, but let me begin by reading the passage we're gonna be looking at this morning, Matthew 18, starting in verse 21. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And when he began to settle, one, of them, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees and pouring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him saying, pay what you owe. And so his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused and he went out and put him in prison until he shall pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. And then his master summoned him and said, you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to his jailers until he should pay all his debt. And so my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. May God bless the reading of his word. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege that we do have this morning to come. And Father, to be able to study your word. Thank you for the truths that are here. Father, I thank you for the way that you helped me understand. But Father, I also understand, and as we study this, man, it's a hard idea not only to understand, but to apply. And Father, I know that there may be, there are certainly people that are here today that are struggling with long-term issues of forgiveness and anger. And, and Father, Jesus' words here is gonna poke it at an uncomfortable place. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would work. And Father, where our hearts are defensive, that your Holy Spirit would pierce that defensiveness. Father, to reveal the need because ultimately you want to heal a wound. Father, I pray your blessing now. I pray that your spirit were to work in Jesus' name, amen. In 2010, uh, Laura Hildebrandt uh, wrote a book called Unbroken and it was so well received that it was on the bestseller list for about two years. In fact, so much so that a couple of years later it was then made into a movie of the same title. Uh, the book and the movie both tell the st a true story of a guy named Louis uh, Zamberini. Uh, he first came to national attention in 1936 when he ran for the U.S. Olympic team at only 19 years old. And then when the World War II started, he uh, joined the Air Force. He was stationed in the Pacific uh, as a bombardier on a B-24. But then in May 1943, his bomber experienced difficulties as they were over the Pacific Ocean. It crashed into the ocean. And, and he and two of his other crewmates survived the crash. Um, but then they were left on this raft without any supplies in the middle of the ocean. And against all odds, they survived 47 days, longer than anyone thought possible, dealing with sharks and dealing with starvation and, and uh, enemy aircraft and, and more. And then after 47 days, it actually got worse because they then went ashore, it came ashore in the uh, Jap Japanese occupied Marshall Islands. And they were captured by the Japanese and thrown into a prisoner of war camp where they were you know, incredibly uh, beaten and mistreated. And, and, and Sam Brini specifically became the prime focus of one of the guards uh, who they referred to as the bird. And the bird you know, spent two years trying to torture him and, and trying to break his, goal, his, his will to live. And now the film was advertised as the story of the power of human will, that in spite of everything that happened to him, in spite of the you know, crash and the bird's attempts to break him, that Sam Brini remained unbroken. 
Now, while the movie, I think on the whole, was very good, and it was mostly true to the story, it was also incomplete in that it didn't tell the whole story. Again, the movie gives the impression that Zamperini survived through the shipwreck and through the imprisonment and through uh, the Japanese guards, and he refused to be broken, and he came back after the war as this unbroken war hero. But that's not what happened. The book did a better job of telling the whole story than the movie did. Uh, the fact is, when he came back from the war, he was actually a very broken man. He was broken by anger. He was consumed by his anger and hatred for the Japanese guards, especially the bird. And to deal with that, he began to drink very heavily. His anger, combined with his heavy drinking, put a tremendous strain on his young marriage to the point that it was falling apart. In fact, let me share more of this story, not from what I would tell you, but from people who knew Lo Sambrini, the author of the book, and and some of his family members reflecting on that time in his life. When Lou came home from the war, he became an instant celebrity. Life of parties and people paying attention to you, and Lou came home with a pretty amazing story. He was kind of dazzled by his sudden fame. Everyone knew he was this miracle survivor. He had been given up for dead, and suddenly he was alive and had this incredible story to tell, and he was a huge star. He tried to fit back in into a world that was completely different than when he had left it. But he was inside starting to come apart emotionally, just from all the trauma he had gone through. When Louis came back from the war, he was a damaged person. He held on to his hatred for the bird and his other captors. My father was drinking a lot and heavily to self-medicate. He was violent, he was an alcoholic, he was plagued with nightmares. Night after night he woke up uh, having the same nightmare of grabbing the bird by the throat and strangling him. He had plotted to save up enough money to get back to Japan and find him and take care of him. And I mean, kill the guy. His life was a shambles. He was destroying his marriage, and I think he was heading toward drinking himself to death. I mean, you hear that part of the story, and you realize this was not a guy that was unbroken. He was very broken. And it, to the degree where it kind of came to a head where we'd have these nightmares, and, and one night that he was dreaming that he was strangling the bird, and he woke up, he was straddled, straddled his wife, and he was strangling her. And, and at that point, she's like, you know, I'm out of here. I can't, I can't deal with this. And, and when you hear a story like that, and you hear about this man who dealt with that horrific abuse, had incredible anger, you know, the question is, how do you deal with that? Is there any hope when things are that bad? And I know that there are people here today that you've experienced abuse, experienced betrayal, you've experienced you know, incredible wounds from other people. And, and sometimes, for some of you, that might have been a part of your life now, that anger and that, that hatred, that resentment for years or decades. How do you deal with it? Is there hope to overcoming that anger? Now, the story of Zampini is, you know, in the book, it's called Unbroken, but he was broken. He not only was broken by that anger, the fact is he was controlled by it. It was, its impact was controlling him. It was destroying his life. It was destroying his marriage. But the good news is that for Louis Zampini, there was hope. And there's another part of his story that we'll come back to later. And, and the fact is there is hope, there is forgiveness. And, and likewise for any of us, there is hope that we don't have to be controlled by these things. There is a path to freedom. There is a path to forgiveness. It's founded on a relationship with God. It's founded on the truth of his word. And this morning we're looking at Matthew 18 and, and we're seeing that, you know, last week for those who were with us, it, you know, Peter or Jesus was teaching us about the importance of confrontation. We've got to deal with issues. And, and that's good, but sometimes we confront and we realize, okay, well, there's an issue and there's a wound. Somebody has wronged us and, and it's not just the confrontation, but then how do we forgive? And Peter anticipated that. So we see him in, in verse 21, you know, he comes to, to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I say to you, not seven times, but 77 times. And so he comes with a question, when do I need to forgive? How often do I need to forgive? How many times do I need to forgive? You know, is there a place? And, and I think when Peter's coming and asking that, he knows that forgiveness is important. He knows that patience is important. And, 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 but he's also coming with the assumption, Jesus, but I know we can have too much of those things. So, so what is the limit? 
And in a lot of ways, he's asking a religious question. What is the rule? Well, you know, how many, what do I have to do? How many times do I have to do it? And when he says seven times, I think that he's assuming that he's you know, being incredibly generous. And, but in that, it's illegalism. It's like, okay, again, what do I have to do? How many times do I have to do? I, tell me the rule that I have to obey. And Jesus comes back and he says, basically he's saying, you know, you, you're asking him the wrong question. You know, he says, I not say to you not seven times, but 77 times. And it actually could even be translated not 77, but many translations have it 70 times seven. For example, the New Living Translation, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. And now the point is not, okay, well, is it 77 or 490? You know, which I'm hoping it's 77 because because I've got a record here and this person, they're already up to 39, so they're gonna get to 77 a lot closer than 490. No, that's not the point here, okay? It's not a rule of how many times you're trying to do it. It's not a matter of calculation. Uh, What he's saying is forgive without ever stopping. And, And then to explain what he means here, then he explains forgiveness in terms of this parable about this debt and the servant and the forgiven, and then he's unwilling to forgive. And, and, and he explains forgiveness in terms of releasing and paying a debt. Because everything in this parable is about a debt. It's about a financial debt. That a servant owes 10,000 talents. It's an amount of money. And the king releases him from that debt. And then he goes out and he and sees someone else who owes him. And he's unwilling to forgive. It's not just in this parable, but in all areas of life, when we think about anger and we think about unforgiveness, it's always an issue of debt. When another person wrongs you, there's a sense that they've taken something from you. There's a loss. Now, the vast majority of times, the loss isn't financial. It's not a matter of money, but it's pain and it's suffering. It, it's trauma and it's dealing with traumatic memories. It's taking your childhood or taking the dreams of marriage that you have, taking some opportunity that you've lost. And, and there's a real debt. It's not a monetary debt, but there's a debt and you feel it and you feel like the other person owes you. They're, they're liable to you, and, and now the question is, what are you going to do with that? And you really only have two options of what you're going to do with that debt. One is that you can try to make them pay. And so it could be very direct, and you're going to say, okay, I'm going to try to make you pay. I'm going to, I'm going to try to hurt you. I'm going to try to gossip about you. I'm going to try to you know, you know, ruin your marriage. I'm going to try to do whatever. It, I could be mean. Or another variation of that is sometimes that we save up the debt for future payment. And so the thing is, is I'm not necessarily going to seek revenge, but I'm not going to forgive. And I'm going to hold this against you. And I'm going to give away the little interest payments of, you know, this, this statement that here, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to heap guilt on you. I'm going to make sure that you know that you're a debtor, that you owe me. So that's one option is we try to make them pay the debt. The other option is we release the debt. See, in a sense, if we could say simply put, anger is holding on to a debt and it's reserving the right to seek payment or seeking payment you know, now or sometime in the future. And forgiveness, simply put, is releasing the debt. But it's even more than that. It's actually not just releasing, it's actually paying the debt ourselves. Now think about this parable itself. You have the king who forgives the debt. Now it's a debt that is owed to him. And when he forgives it, he's giving up his right to that money. He's, in a sense, eating the debt. Now, let me give an illustration of even this idea. Let's say that, you know, I was driving in this morning and I was a little distracted. And I pulled in the parking lot and I uh, sideswiped a car coming into the parking. And, and um, you know, it's just an illustration. But let's say, for example, it's, it's a, it was a, a tan uh, Subaru Outback license plate number. Uh, no, no, not that diff- didn't really happen. Um, Somebody with a tan Subaru out back is now really upset with me. I didn't mean to worry you. We might have forgiveness issues at the end of the service. Um, but let's just say, in theory, okay, I scraped this car, um, a long gash down the side. Now, what are the options? A person could find out and they become angry. I'm going to make you pay. I'm never coming back to church again. You know, they go in a fit, a rage. Or we could sit there and say, you know, I acknowledge that I'm wrong. You know, take it to the dealer and, you know, I'll pay whatever. It's my, my, my fault. I should pay the cost. That's fair, right? Or they can look at me and they can say, I know you didn't mean to do it. And um, you know what? You don't need to worry about it. I forgive you. Now, now, if they say that, I forgive you, what happens then? Well, we're at a church. We know what happens, right? We're in the parking lot. They say, I forgive you. Suddenly, angels are singing from the sky. Oh. You know, and there's, a, there's a, a glow that comes down and the car is miraculously restored. And 
And you're like, yeah, in what world? Now, of course, that doesn't happen. What happens? They say, I forgive you, and the, and the damage is still there. And what that means is that means I'm going to take it in and I'm going to pay it. I'm going to eat the cost. I'm going to, to pay for the repair. And the same thing is true when we forgive of any problem, any debt. There is a problem there. And we're saying, in a sense, I'm taking responsibility for the wound. There is a wound. There, there is a debt. It shouldn't be overlooked. It shouldn't be depreciated. And often the debt is large. The harm that is done is significant. And that shouldn't be ignored. In fact, something that I hear in church circles all the time is, you know, well, we need to forgive and forget, which, which in practice usually means, oh, and let's not make a big deal, but let's, let's ignore it and bury it. Um, let's place it on the rug and just ignore what happened. It's a terrible idea. It's a, not a biblical idea at all. Forgiveness means that, no, that not that we make it little and just ignore it. It means that we acknowledge the debt. We acknowledge that what happened. There is a real debt and we need to make a choice to say, this is what happened and I'm either going to hold on to it and make you pay or I'm going to release the debt and I'm in a sense to, to accept the cost of what was done. You, you harmed me. And I accept that you harmed me. And I'm going to pay that cost, and I'm not going to try to make you pay me back. Now, you might be thinking, that sounds hard. And it is. <laughs> it is hard. It, this is a really difficult thing to do. But yet God calls us to do it. And not only calls us, but he teaches us how to do it, how we can forgive. And so let's look at this parable. And um, because he's giving us these incredible truths to understand how to forgive those who have wronged us, starting in verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle his accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents, and since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, the payment to be made. So a servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, I will pay everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave the debt. Now, the first thing that he's telling us we need to remember is we need to remember that we're sinners who need forgiveness. Again, now in this parable, you have this man who owed 10,000 talents. It was an unpayable debt. Now, we hear talents, we don't know what that means. It was actually a weight. It wasn't, a, it wasn't money, it was a weight. It was largest uh, measurement. So we might say a ton is our largest measurement. And that's what it was. It was a, a weight. In, in our measurement, it was a, a little over 94 pounds. So a talent would have been 94 pounds of silver or 94 pounds of gold. Now let's take it in lower amounts. So let's take the silver, okay? Now translated in modern money, um, if a, this week's silver is selling for $22.82 an ounce. That means a single talent would be worth over $35,000, which means 10,000 talents would be worth more than $350 million. That's a huge amount. Now, obviously, this guy, he has 10,000 talents. He could never repay that debt. He couldn't pay the interest. And so when he's coming, have patience with me, I'll pay. No, there's no way in the world that he could. And according to the law of that time, what the king had the right to do was to take everything that that man owed and sell everything, including the man himself, his wife and his children, sell them into slavery and whatever he got would go towards paying the debt. But the man pleads with the king, you know, have patience with me. He knows that everything in his life is about to be, you know, you know lost. And out of pity, the master of the servant released him and forgave the debt. Now the king ate the debt. Even if you're a king, $350 million hurts you, okay? This is a huge amount that's very costly. And he forgives, he pays the price. And Jesus' point here is that all of us are like this servant who owed 10,000 talents. We're all sinners who need to be forgiven. We, we all have this huge debt before God that's beyond our ability to pay. Now, some people might think, well, it's not that big. I try to pay God back. That's the spirit of religion. And so they come and you might be here today. Well, I'm coming to church and I'm giving a little bit of money and I'm, and I'm trying to do good things. And, and yeah, I've done some, you know, but I'm trying to whittle it down. And if I can somehow get it down to a more manageable level. And again, that's the spirit of legalistic religion. That's not biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity is a debt. We can't pay the interest, let alone ever make a movement on the principle. See, the only hope is what this man found was to throw himself at the mercy of the king. For us to come and say, God, I agree with you. I'm saying, I can never pay it back. And my only hope is for not only to be forgiven, but for God to pay the debt, which is what happens at the cross. 
Jesus pays the debt by taking our death upon himself, this ultimate cost. And our sole only hope is now to accept the forgiveness of grace of God. Now, when we struggle with forgiving other people, it's because we forget that we are sinners forgiven by God. And it's vital to remember, because you know, what happens is that we can step back when we're wronged. And if I can't forgive, it's, it's often a kind of this sense of indignation. You know, how dare they do that? I deserve better than that. And, and we're almost, you know, acting like, well, I didn't contribute anything to the problem. I don't do bad things like ourselves. And we define ourselves as innocent victims that have been wronged. And, you know, we've never done anything wrong. And to some degree, our anger and unforgiveness is rooted in pride because we struggle with it, bitterness and anger towards people you know, that have done us wrong, thinking that we're superior. We aren't bad people like them. You know, it's, it's saying, I deserve better. In fact, if you think about this, you know, a lot of times what happens and what makes forgiveness so difficult is that, is that when somebody does something wrong, we see them as a caricature. You know, think about a caricature. If you go to a fair or somewhere, they have somebody writing, the, you know, doing these caricatures, these little um, cartoons. And a caricature always takes one thing of, out of the person's um, uh, you know, appearance and it kind of blows it out of proportion. And so I thought about it, even a couple post, uh, you know, former presidents and you see examples, you know, Barack Obama, you know, it's the ears and the big smile. And, and so that's blown out of proportion. Or, you know, you think Donald Trump and it's the hair and, you know, kind of lecturing, you're fired. And, and it, it takes it out of proportion, makes it kind of humorous. It's not a true care, picture. And what I believe happens is when somebody wrongs us, we do this to them. We define them. So somebody lied to me. Well, they're a liar. That's who they are. That's the character. They got the big ears. They, you know, that's, that's who they are. Now, do you have your real eye? Yeah, I have, but, you know, but there were other circumstances. And, and, and you've got to understand, for me, it was complex. And, and there were things that were happening. And, and, and I do good things that outweigh the bad. I'm not that one thing. That's just a little part of me. But for them, it's the one thing. And what we need to realize is, no, we're all sinners. I, I can't judge the other person for what they've done because that's not who they are. And nor can I justify myself. We're all sinners who need God's forgiveness. Not only that, but I need to realize how much I've been forgiven. Let's go back to the parable. Again, we saw that the servant owed the king an unpayable debt, that 10,000 talents. He pleaded for mercy. The king forgave him. And now you would think somebody that had been forgiven this incredible debt would be overwhelmed by gratitude and it would overflow in his relationships with other people. But that's not what happened. Look what happened, verse 28. Then when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused and went and put him in prison until he shall pay the debt. Now here's a part of this passage that I think is often misunderstood. I've, I've heard this taught before, and usually when it's taught, They'll say 10,000 talents, it's huge debt, and then this guy owed 100 denarii. It was a small amount, $50, you know, it was nothing. Actually, that's not accurate. It says it's 100 denarii. Well, what's a denarii? A denarii was a small coin, uh, but actually had great value. It was the equivalent of a daily wage for an average worker. So now let's put it again into our day, day's money. So let's say an average worker, $15 an hour. Eight, eight, eight hours a day, $120 you know, a day, 100 days wage, that's $12,000. That's a third of a year's income. And so when this comes and he says, okay, this man, you know, you owe me 100 dinner, that's $12,000 isn't trivial. That's a really significant amount. It's just small in comparison to the debt that he had been forgiven. And so in same ways with us, you know, you know, sometimes somebody said, well, just forgive me, it's not a big deal. And you're sitting there saying, wait, it doesn't was a big deal. You don't know how they wronged me. You don't know how they hurt me. You don't know the damage that was done. It's no trivial thing. And the fact of the matter is we need to acknowledge the debt. If we pretend it's a small item, if we just pretend, oh, it's $50, we'll never be able to forgive. That's where the problem of forgive and forget comes. Oh, it's just a small thing. You just bury it. No, it's a big debt. It's a huge thing. It's a huge wrong that has been done. And you need to acknowledge that to be able to forgive it. But even as you acknowledge how you've been wronged, we need to same time, at the same time realize that as great as their sin against you may have been, it's still nothing in comparison to the debt that has been forgiven by you for, or by God for you. And it's only when we are able to forgive, uh, we will only be able to, degree, or to forgive to the degree that we understand and have experienced God's forgiveness. 
If, if we're sitting there and we don't understand how we've been forgiven, if we don't understand this insurmountable debt that we owe to God and we've been forgiven, then we're gonna struggle forgiving someone else. And on the other hand, if we really understand what we've been forgiven, yes, what somebody else did to you is really wrong. But it's tiny compared to what God has done for us. And so we have to each one ask ourselves, will I having been forgiven so much by God refuse to forgive another person so little? And my being forgiven from by God is always related to my ability to forgive. And you see this taught by Jesus throughout his teaching. For example, even in the Lord's Prayer, look at what he teaches about praying of forgiveness. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. So there's a relationship between us coming and trusting in God for our forgiveness and our ability to forgive others as well. They're directly related. So okay, then how do we do this? Well, the fact is some of you might now have somebody in mind of somebody that you hold something against, somebody you're angry with and somebody that you have a hard time forgiving and and, and it's not a minor issue. It's maybe a significant debt. What do you do? What is Jesus teaching us here? Uh, let me first of all ask you, have you accepted Christ as your savior for your forgiveness of your sins? Do you understand the debt that you owe to God? It starts there. You know, if, you, if you're still trying to work your way towards God, if you're trying to pay off your own debt, you'll never understand his forgiveness and you won't be able to give it to someone else. Now, if you have, then take a moment to reflect on Jesus' death on the cross. Do you understand what he has done for you? Do you understand the, the, the size of the debt that he paid at all? Remember how much you've been forgiven and that God will never ask you to pay a debt that's anywhere close to the debt that he's forgiven you. But now that you remember that and you realize, okay, God does call you to, to, to forgive, not because the person deserves it, but out of gratitude that we should be changed by the way that we have been forgiven. But now God calls you to forgive and you need to realize that it is an act of the will. It's not a feeling, it's a choice. And many people believe that forgiveness is primarily a feeling. You know, I'm angry, I'm mad, and, and, and until you have the feeling, you can't do it. And you're waiting for the emotion. But, but actually the opposite is true, it's a action that results in a feeling. Think about even Jesus' response to Peter. I mean, when, when Jesus, Peter comes, how many times? Seven times, and Jesus says, you know, not seven times, but 77 times. Yeah, if somebody kept wronging you that many times, do you feel like you're gonna, you know, are you gonna feel like forgiving them? Are you gonna feel warm towards a person that continues to wrong you? No. Or in, in Luke 17, uh, you have Jesus, another account of Jesus responding to a very similar question. And look what he says in Luke 17, four. If he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Now, why does he say seven times in a day? Again, it's saying that feeling, it's not about feelings. Uh, it's impossible to get rid of the emotion seven times in the day. You're not gonna feel it, I guarantee you. Forgiveness is something that you do while you're still angry. And so, according to the Bible, we're called to grant forgiveness before we feel it. We make the decision to release and to cancel the debt even if we don't feel it, and what you're gonna find is only after we make the choice, then God will start to change our heart. He'll begin to soften us. It's an act of the will, but it's also a process. You know, a lot of times, I know in my own life, you know, there have been times it's like if somebody has wronged me and I forgive them and I thought I forgave them and, and next thing you know, I run into them somewhere else and, and say, man, I, I'm angry where they do something, and man, you always do that, and suddenly I realize, okay, maybe I didn't really forgive them. Uh, now here's what you've gotta realize. A lot of times, especially when we have issues that are, we've held on to for a long time, the, the anger is deep. It's deep in our heart. And, and the fact is, I can forgive somebody, I'm only forgiving them in the anger that I'm aware of, but there's a lot of stuff I'm probably not aware of. And, and here's almost even the picture that I, I see is that, you know, I think of my life as kind of like a garden and any of the gardeners and you, you go and there's all kinds of rocks and things and you clear off the rocks and, and what happens after the winter and the spring comes, there's all kinds of rocks that are there. You know, they're, they're not the old rocks, they're new rocks that were hidden underneath the ground and it got pushed up. But you had to clear off the old rocks before the new ones come up. Now that's what anger is often like. Yeah, in fact, there are times that I, I used to say I forgave that person. God's humbled me enough on this that I can say at best, I think I've forgiven them as best as I know. But I've always got to be open to the fact that there may be issues I haven't dealt with. 
because I've got to be aware that there are, there are rocks that are still coming up. And so forgiveness is a process and you need to be willing to go through the process and it's not just a one-time deal because ultimately it's not just something we do, it's a matter of the heart. True forgiveness is always from the heart. Again, remember Peter's coming and saying, how many times do I have to do performance? But Jesus makes it a matter of the heart and he makes it clear at the very end, look at what he says in verse 35. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. Now, those of us who have young children, we remember at times that, you know, your kids will do something wrong and they'll, one will hit the other and say, so I'm sorry, and I'm sorry, and say, say, I forgive you, I forgive you. you know, and you could tell that a lot of times they don't mean it at all. You're trying to teach them the right thing to do. And sometimes they might even fool you. We never fool God. And God just doesn't want us to say the word. He wants it to be the heart. Now, let me share, personally, I struggle with this because I'm not ever sure if I've really forgiven the person from the heart. And, and, I, and let me share just even my own walk and where God's confronted me, even a verse that he's used. Um, I, I'm in in uh, Romans chapter 12, there's a great passage, a whole second half of the chapter is all about forgiveness. And, and one time I was dealing with you know, forgiveness and some anger towards a person, and I came across Romans 12, 14, which says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Now blessing means to pray for God's blessing. Pray for God's good. And I realized, okay, God was telling me, okay, if you really forgave this person, you're gonna pray for God's blessing on them. And it was like, okay, are you able to pray for God's blessing? And, and my honest response was, well, well, God, they would really be blessed if you humbled them and pointed out their sin and you made them miserable. And after making them miserable, then bless them that way. And, 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 you know, and I felt God coming back to me and saying, if I, could I bless them without breaking them and humbling them? well, you can only bless them after they see their sin and they come and apologize to me. And well, what if I saw them sin and they never apologized to you? Would that be okay? No, you know, it's good. God, this is the right way you gotta bless them. And the fact of the matter is, is that I, deep in my heart, I was showing, I couldn't pray for the person's blessing. Deep part of me wanted them to be humiliated, to be, to be exposed, to suffer in some way. And God was showing me that I had a heart issue. And I had not forgiven at the heart level. And so we need to struggle with that. It is not easy. And we need to realize that if we don't do that, what happens is that it, not only our heart is wrong, but our anger actually shapes the heart in the wrong way. Romans um, you know, 12, uh, um, you know, it says that, you know, you know that, that, we, that there are consequences, that if we don't forgive, what happens is that we actually start to become shaped by our lack of forgiveness that it controls us, it imprisons us. Look at again, starting in verse 31. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master what had taken place. And his master summoned him and said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and you should you have not had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And his anger, his master, delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all the debt, and so my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Now, let me ask you, what is he saying there in verse 34 and 35? That, the, you know, that he handed him the jailers, they should pay, pay off his debt, and your heavenly father will do that to you. Is it saying that you can risk lose your salvation? If you don't forgive, that salvation, you know, that's a work that we have to do to earn. No, that's not what it's saying. So what is it saying? You know what I think it's saying? is that if you're unwilling to forgive, anger imprisons you. If you're unwilling to forgive, you become controlled by the anger. You become defined by the anger. As one person said, you know, anger is like, like a acid. It always does way more damage to the vessel it's held in to whatever you wanna pour it out on. And that's what's the case. We're holding on to it because we wanna punish the other person. We want, and the thing is, is it's punishing us. I mean, you know, think about even the story of Louis Zambrini. I mean, here you've got a guy who was broken. He wasn't only broken, he was imprisoned by his anger. He was controlled by his anger. He was defined by it. And, and that's the fact is if we're unwilling to forgive, it will always control us. I think we talked about uh, Romans 12. And Romans 12, 21 says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What happens when we're unwilling to forgive? We become overcome by evil. We become defined by it. We become controlled by it. 
Oftentimes, the person that wronged us, man, I hate what they did to me. I, I'm thinking about doing the same thing. I become like them. I become the very thing that I hate. That's the power of anger. That's the power of unforgiveness. So how do we find the ability to forgive? It's vital. It's vital that we do this. Because it, again, it's a matter of being controlled, but how do we find the ability to forgive? Again, it starts by acknowledging our own need before God. Have you brought your sins before God? Are you, do you know you have a relationship with him? Are you forgiven by him? If you're doing the religion thing and you're trying to say, well, I'm paying it off. I'm trying to do the good thing. See, then you're gonna look at someone else and you're gonna make them pay you off. It's never gonna work. And it starts by getting a relationship with God, getting yourself right with God. It starts there. And then once you have that, then reflect on God's grace. Be amazed at what God has done for you. And then realize that forgiveness, again, it's not just a matter of performance. It's not just something that you do as religion. It's a matter of the heart. And my problem is that I'm unforgiving in the heart. How do I change my heart? I can't change my heart. You can't change your own heart. And forgiveness is ultimately coming and saying, God, I recognize what you have done, and I recognize my, un my unforgiveness, my anger is wrong. And I ask you to forgive me, and I ask you to change my heart. And I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm still angry, I'm still, but God, I give you the right to take it. Now that's hard. Why? Because there's that person that has wronged you, and you're unwilling to let go of the, the debt. But God, I gotta hold it back. I've gotta make sure they pay. Are you willing to let it go? Leave it up to God. Say, God, it's yours. I release it. You take it. You change my heart. You give me the ability to forgive. And if you ask him to do it, he will do it. He will change you. He will give you freedom in a way that transforms who you are. And you can take people, there's so many stories of people who have been controlled by that anger, that have been defined by it, and, and, and yet suddenly they find freedom in the gospel. Even an example like the guy we started with, was Louis, Louis, Louis Zamberini, a real life man who was controlled. He was defined by it. It was destroying his life, and we can understand it. There was an incredible debt to be paid. But yet he realized, ultimately, that he, he couldn't fix it. And he came, first of all, to a relationship with God, of understanding his own debt before God, and then ultimately, saying, okay, if God has forgiven me, then how do I forgive others? Let me, again, let you hear his story, in this case, in part from his own mouth. He went through some terrible years where he was destroying his marriage, but Louis was saved by his wife's insistence that he go to see a sermon by Billy Graham, who at that time was a very young man, not very well known, but he was speaking in Los Angeles. Louis didn't want to go, but his wife was going to leave him. And he agreed on that basis to go see him speak. And he sat in the back of the audience and he was unhappy and he was sullen, but Graham spoke of things that resonated with Louis, with his experience about how God reaches into people's lives and helps them get through things that seem unsurvivable. I think all the prisoners have basically made the same prayer. Get me hold of life to my family, God, and I'll seek you, I'll serve you. And you make promises while you're under a dire situation. But uh, how many of them keep their promise? I didn't. And so my life fell apart. And it was at that moment that he made this realization to, to himself that he thought God had actually helped him through this and he owed God something. And he realized what he needed to do. So I went forward in the meeting and made my confession of faith in Christ and I couldn't believe what happened. While I was still on my knees, my life changed in a matter of moments because I knew I was through getting drunk, and I knew that I forgave my guards, and I knew it was a miracle because I forgave the bird. <laughs> and, and that was the first night. The first night in two and a half years, I didn't have a nightmare, and I haven't had one since. When Louis realized that God can forgive him for all the rotten things he did in his life, that he ought to be able to forgive those that had done him wrong. So forgiving 
the guards and the bird uh, was actually salvation for him. It really turned him around in an instant. He decided he needed to test his forgiveness to see if he really had truly achieved it. And he went back to Japan to meet the guards who had, who had abused him so terribly. And he went to Sagama prison where they were all being held for war crimes. He went to every single one and looked him in the eye and told him that he forgave him for mm -hmm. the treatment that he received when he was a prisoner of war. He felt no animosity. He just felt compassion, and they couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. It was, it was a wonderful experience. He knew he had truly forgiven them. I think it's incredible that he forgave them. That's a lesson that he taught my father and me. By hating somebody, I'm not hurting them. I'm only hurting myself. You can forgive anybody. Forgiveness is always possible. An incredible story. But again, when we hear a story about like that, you say forgiveness is always possible. When God does that kind of miracle in a man's life like that, is there any of us that have things that God is unable to do that miracle? We whose sins have been forgiven, who have been forgiven this 10,000 talent, incredible debt, understanding what God has done for us, then willing to come and say, God, here's my heart. I'm willing to let you change it. God, I may, you may not feel like you want to forgive. You might feel the anger. But you're willing to say, God, I give you that debt. I give you that anger. I, give, I ask you to change me. I ask you to give me the ability to forgive, even to show kindness and compassion to those who have wronged me. I hope and pray that you're willing to do that. I believe that God wants to do some, some miracles in this room, even today. He wants to bring some incredible healing to some incredible wounds that have, that have bound people for years or decades. God has the ability to do that. And that is it for this week's message. If you have a question about the message, Community Church, or Jesus Christ, send us a text to 330-400-3242. You can learn more about our events and community groups online at ccpl.life connect. There, you can also send in a prayer request. We would love to pray for you. Have a blessed Lord's Day, and we'll see you next week.